Welcome everyone to the EOS Fireside Chat for May the 10th. Thank you for joining us for another compelling session of our live Fireside Chats on Discord. This week we're exploring a multitude of exciting developments in the EOS network, including the EOS Comeback Coin Telegraph article by Jillian Godsill, Alcor Exchange Update with Zuler, the Wombat X Accelerator has been announced. We've got Adrian, the CEO and co-founder of Wombat, on the show with us today. Pomelo Season 6 officially goes multi-pool. We'll hear more about that from Andrew. And then, of course, the EOS EVM webinar that's happening soon. We'll be hearing from Nathan and others uh, from Zysan for that webinar. DeFi Box says, has an EOS EVM RPC node. BBS Network interview has been released. And... We've got some Haifa DAO updates. A couple of Haifa friends are joining us today. Alex Prate, Growth and Services. Joachim Stroh, DAO Business Adoption. Dominic Thomas for Business Development. Gabriel Shaw for Marketing Product. Mark Epstein for Finance. And then we're going to finish off the show with, of course, the open mic and open, open off-topic banter. All right, remember to engage the show by liking, commenting, subscribing to stay up to date with all things EOS. We can't wait to see you every week at the Fireside Chat. All right, Eve, hope that pumped you up. But before we get to Eve, we're going to just give you a quick reminder to claim your pop tokens on Discord if you're joining us for the show. The April draw is happening this week. 94 entries that we got. I think that's a record. And we'll be giving out some nice goodies so look out for that in the uh, next few days. All right, let's get right into it. Lots of topics, lots of guests. First up, Yves Larose is going to talk to us a bit about Recover Plus and how it's interacting with the newly released EOS EVM. Take it away, Yves. All right, uh, how do I position this? I'll give you guys some context of known knowns. I'll give you guys some known unknowns and I'll, and then obviously the unknown unknowns why I can't share because they're unknown. Um, no known. Last Friday night, uh, my time, so May 5th, around uh, 8 p.m. or so, Eastern time, uh, a community member alerted me of a potential hack in progress due to anomalies found on chain. Those anomalies had started roughly 38 minutes before. Within uh, about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, we had a series of BPs reviewing those anomalies, or what, what seemed to be anomalies at that time, and looking at what could potentially be underway as a, as a potential hack. Within about 40 minutes of me being alerted. We had Recover Plus uh, alerted, woken up, and we had uh, the majority of the BPs on this. Um, and so we started reviewing what, as I mentioned, was seemingly weird transactions on chain, but did seem to point that it was, it was a hack in progress. Um, that hack uh, seemed to be in the Paycash app uh, for an amount of roughly $4 million USDT. Um, I'm, again, to put this in context, I'm parsing my words a little bit because um, as with any hack, as has happened in the past, you never know if the information you're getting is being fed to you uh, because it is the hacker potentially and or that what you are seeing is um, you know, who's in on it and who, who isn't and or X, Y, Z. There's a lot of unknowns. What we know from the past um, in uh, the two main hacks that occurred on EOS is that both those instances, the hacker reached out to key people in the community to uh, essentially, um, I guess, out themselves as a hacker uh, requesting ransom and or trying to attempt to, to, uh, to start negotiations. In both of those attempts, there were negotiations that were uh, reached and ultimately it led to the creation of the Recover Plus program. Um, in, in an attempt to 
in the future as a new hack happens because it's just a question of time there will be more this won't be the last that there's somewhat of a framework around what is uh what is at the base minimum required for the network to potentially intervene into something should they decide to do so uh, recover plus is not a guarantee that something uh is possible it's not a guarantee that uh funds would be recovered but it is very much a framework around trying to put you know, as much as possible uh, the right metrics and or the right data in place for something to be done should that be the the ultimate decision. Um, again, as you can mention, as you can see, I'm, I'm choosing my words carefully. There's a big reason for that. Uh, one is the current so to speak, hack in progress, and I say in progress because nothing has been stopped, is still in progress. No hacker has come out as, uh, as, as you know, claiming to be the hacker. And there are a lot of inconsistencies in this story from the very beginning. And so we really don't know who we're talking to. Uh, I'll be very clear. Uh, it is possible this is an inside job. We have no idea. We always have to assume that um you know un un unless we we know and unless we can know we have to assume that everything is on the table in this instance uh as i mentioned about 40 minutes after being alerted which would have been roughly 80 minutes after the first transaction um that transpired that that uh, seemed to be highlighting an exploit within code that we didn't have access to because this project was not audited non msigged um, and not open source. Um, and for context as well, this project had been reached out to by the Recover Plus team a long time ago when Recover Plus was created. And this project decided not to participate in Recover Plus for whatever uh, reason. And so we were aware of the hack well before the team itself was even aware that it was being hacked. Um, and to give you a sense of that timeline, it was roughly 12 hours before the team itself even seemingly recognized that they were under, um, under attack or had been, had been hacked. During this period of time, we tried to communicate with the team as we did in previous instances uh, because they had not signed up for Recover Plus to get the information so that we could potentially intervene and do something um, unsuccessfully. Uh, and so this team was not responsive during this period of time. When the team started being responsive, uh, actually, let me back up beforehand. During this period of time as well, so the night of the 5th, so last Friday night, my time, Eastern time, uh, we started seeing the patterns of what potentially could have been the, the uh, hack. Because again, we're going in blind. We don't have access to the code. We don't have... We've got nothing. All we've got are transactions on chain that seemingly point to what could be happening, but we really don't know. And so we have the best people working on this, trying to figure out what potentially could be happening. And what we saw was that, you know, of the 4 million USDT that had seemingly been um, uh, exploited, that um, it had now been transferred over to DeFi box. And I don't recall if it's the majority or, or all of it was being transferred over to EOS. Um, and so we're also speculating as to why that might be. Is there a potentially an exploit in DeFi box? Um, and, you know, think back at that time, we really don't know. Everything is happening live. We're monitoring live. Um, what we came, I guess what the likely scenario was at that time that we could figure out was that there was nothing wrong with DeFi box, everything was good there, but that to exit USDT is incredibly difficult because there are only two exchanges that formally support USDT. I, I think there's a third one, but um, for that amount of liquidity, Binance and Bitfinex. But Binance and Bitfinex at those levels require KYC. And so it's very difficult if you want to exit $4 million to go through those exchanges. Um, I also want to be very clear, it is possible the hacker is listening in right now and is looking forward to hearing what we may or may not do, and I will not share that information. Um, so keep that in mind as well if you're listening right now. Um, but all the information I'm sharing right now can be shared. Um, and so we saw that USDT 
was being sold for EOS seemingly because it's much easier to exit EOS than it is to exit um, USDT. We then saw a portion of the USDT being sent to um, an exchange. I believe it's changenow.io. Um, but again, if you're trying to liquidate $4 million worth of EOS, there's only so many plays that you can do so. And so some have been sent there, um, but it seems like the hacker changed its target, uh, either because it was too difficult or they hit their KYC limits there um, or whatever it may be. No idea. Um, then is, so I don't recall now what the timeline is, but it's been now a while. So from since we've been alerted to now we're monitoring, we're following this and we've got at this point pretty much all BPs on this and we've got the Recover Plus team and we've got um, experts from um, th that, that we work with, smart contract experts and such like. We've got everybody on this and still we're not getting any answers back from the pay cash team. They're still unresponsive. So the network is well aware before the team is even aware and or maybe they're aware they're just not communicating. This is when then we saw funds started being moved over to EVM uh, accounts being created. Uh, we've seen this in the past. If you recall the uh, hack that occurred, um, Zach helped me out, I just forget the name right now, uh, where 3 million accounts were created. I just forget the name of, of it. Um, we saw the, a, a trend and pattern whereby if you'd like to exit uh, funds, one of the mechanisms to do so is to create a ridiculous amount of accounts and to essentially cascade them from account to account. Um, I don't know, Zach, if you just unmuted. I just heard it's, a sound. Uh, it's e, it was E-Curve that was exploited by yeah. Spider-Man. E yeah. So E-Curve exploit. Um, and so we had seen that pattern before where one of the ways to do this is to split this up in very small accounts. So that also wasn't new. I think there was a total of a little over 6,000 accounts that were created um, in the EVM uh, for this. But we dealt with 3 million accounts within 24 hours uh, prior to that, um, just, just to put it in context. Um, now to kind of address what we can do with the EVM and kind of what the reality is. So this is not news. The only mechanism that we could do at this stage with the EVM, which, which was discussed at the time, was to freeze the EVM. Freezing the EVM, which we have the capacity to do, essentially freezes the chain. It freezes the entire EVM. So it doesn't, it doesn't stop a, a particular account. It doesn't then also give you the chance to do anything with the EOS that are in the, the accounts in the EVM. It literally just freezes the EVM. So nothing can get out. So great, all right, now we block the exit. But there's no mechanism other than just leaving it blocked. Basically, EVM is just done. It, it just stops. Uh, there's no mechanism to be able to then, uh, within the EVM, within those EOS accounts, move those, those EOS outs. Um, that is the reality. That's a fact right now. Uh, one of the things that Zach did mention in the chat earlier, the, the ENF official chat, is that uh, for Re Recover Plus, we are looking at what would it take in order for us to be able to do some tech uh, improvements so that that is um, a reality in the future? It is not currently a reality. Um, effectively, the EVM right now is like any other EVM. Once it's out or just like the E-curve hack, once it crossed that bridge, it's, you know, they're out of the system. They're not on EOS. Um, and so saying that it's on EOS is, is not accurate. Uh, it's, it's within the EVM. Um, and so we actually have no control over that. Uh, what else can I share? Um, reiterate that it is entirely possible that the person that uh, was doing this is listening in right now. And so I have to parse my words in terms of what the ENF um, and or the BPs and or the network can or cannot do um, and or what we will or will not do. Uh, there are also inconsistencies within uh, the Paycash team where the founder or co-founder of Paycash, um, and I'm, this I'm just kind of wavy on the who, but there's an individual representing Paycash that instructed internal developers to say that this was a an internal white hack, um, like security mechanism, uh, test 
while at the same time, other people from within Pcash relaying messages externally that this was a hack. So like there's a lot of inconsistencies there. Um, the Recover Plus signup was incredibly messy. The data being provided to Recover Plus people, incredibly messy. This whole story stinks um, big time. And so this is what I can share right now. Uh, TLDR, the network, Recover Plus, the BPs were on this um, within a very, very, very short period of time. There was a window of opportunity where prior to funds being sent to EVM, Recover Plus as it currently exists could have engaged. That window of opportunity closed down when it was uh, when some of the funds were sent to the EVM. In the future, we are looking at how we could extend that functionality that is possible on native onto EVM, which, as far as I uh, know, would be the only EVM that has this functionality. Um, and that's what I can share at, at this stage. Uh, the idea that EOS is an issue is complete fucking bullshit. And so I'm not going to take that. The idea that EVM is an issue is complete bullshit. And I'm not going to take that. Um, the network did everything it could to give a chance for this um, and for an event like this to be salvageable. And there's only so much the network can do if folks on the other side don't do their part. And I'll leave it at that. All right. Thank you, Eve, for uh, that clarification on some of the events that happened over the weekend. There's a couple of questions in chat. I don't know if you're open to questions or uh, you said what you had to say. I'm definitely happy to move on to other topics. We've got a lot of them lined up anyways. Uh, I can, uh, yes, let me read. I just didn't see, I didn't, um, hold on. Uh, the first one I see... Just the last two messages here. Uh, were funds moved out of the EVM via mobile? Okay, yeah, so there are... No, I'm actually not going to... I'm not going to answer that question, uh, Esteban. Uh, yeah. I can say that as per regular um, procedure, or I guess around the framework, that externals out of EOS have been alerted. Um, and was there another question? I've never heard of Pcash. Is this a real project? As far as I can tell, it is a real project that's been up and running for some time. Um, can't discount that this is internal. Can't discount that this is internal, but that wasn't sanctioned. Can't discount that this is an external uh, hacker. We have no idea. We're running in blind, and unfortunately, the information that we needed in order to be able to act upon this was not provided to us and has yet to be provided to us. And this is why Recover Plus was set up so that people could provide the information that we knew we would need in time to be able to make those determinations ahead of an event occurring. Any other questions? Uh, I'd like to thank, actually, because some of you are on this call, I'd like to thank the community member that alerted me at like 7.40 or so Friday night. I'd like to thank the people that stayed up till 4 or 5 in the morning to work on this, trying to actually get to a resolve. Uh, I'd like to thank the people that did do analysis and tr you know try to figure out what was going on on a Friday night uh, with you know very very little information uh, at at their fingertips to actually try to figure this out. Um, there's a lot of people that worked on this and that are still working on this to try and figure out what happened, what's going on, so that regardless of the outcome, um, that we're able to provide some type of uh, through, through Recover Plus, some type of either uh, post-mortem type of thing or lessons learned and uh, try to improve that uh, project. 
Uh, I also you know, want everybody to understand that very similar, let's say, to pomelo and how pomelo potentially catches people, that we're limited in saying what we, what we do and how we do it. Um, I, again, because the person on the other end could be listening uh, right now. And so it's, it is often a game of cat and mouse. We know that it's just a question of the next one. And so keeping um, that information very much proprietary is uh, by design. So thank you very much for those who, who help and those who've contributed to this in the past and in this particular event. All right, thank you, Eve, for joining us today and uh, for sharing your thoughts on this situation, unfortunate situation. All right, moving on to our next topic of the day, Alcor Exchange AMM version 2. Uh, we brought it up last week or, or week before, but this week I'd like to invite Zuler from the Alcor uh, community to come talk to us a bit more about uh, this project and their updates. Hey guys, can you hear me? Hey Zuler, yeah, we sure can. Welcome to the fireside. How are you doing today? Thank you so much. It is the first time I am here and I am very happy to be here. Even though I am sad to listen about what I just said about the possible hack. I am glad that there are a lot of committed people to solve all the issues that are happening. And I am sure that this will just make the network stronger at the end. All right. So let's, uh, let's get into it. What's been going on with the Alcor exchange lately? Okay, so we're, we're extremely happy with everything that has been going on through Alcor. The, everything started out with us introducing concentrated liquidity. For the people that do not know, Alcor Exchange is a decentralized exchange that allows users to trade a wide range of crypto in this case. And I believe that what characterizes us is our unique community approach. We are the biggest exchange on WAX, and we plan to onboard a lot of people to EOS and become one of the biggest exchanges on EOS. For us to do that, we thought and we believe that we need to have a lot of changes right now in, our, in the way how things work. That's why we came up with the idea of integrating concentrated liquidity, which is a concept that has been going around a lot of time on Ethereum. The first one to implement it was Uniswap, along with the Uniswap v3 version. And we believe that these changes and introduction of concentrated liquidity will allow us to onboard EOS users and also onboard what is users into using EOS. In this case, um, I think I should explain that a little bit to you what is concentrated liquidity for the people that do not know. So the way that a conventional liquidity pool works is that whenever you provide liquidity, it is distributed from a range to zero to infinity across the price. So this can sometimes lead to less than ideal returns because your assets are not focused on the most traded prices and most of your liquidity is not used most of the time. For example, if you take a stable coin pair, for example, USDC and USDT, whenever you provide liquidity to USDC, USDT, you provide liquidity along all the price range from zero to one to 1 1.5. And it is very unlikely for your liquidity to be efficient and working if you're trading an stable coin pair when you have, when it is very unlikely for it to, uh, to reach a price of zero to one in this case. So Alcor Exchange's concentrated liquidity is a unique feature that allows liquidity providers to deposit their assets within a specified price range. In this case, with example of stable coins, you will be able to deposit all your liquidity within the price ranges of, let's say, 0 0.99 and 1.02. In that way, all your liquidity is concentrated, it has a, leaper, a deeper liquidity pool, and it will be distributed along that price range. That means that your liquidity will start working and will be working in the most efficient way when it is on, those, uh, on that price range. Um, what else can I tell to you guys? I mean, with concentrated liquidity, what we are very proud of is that we also allow users to select the fee tier that they want to charge for providing the liquidity. So right now they can charge as, as low as 0 0.03 or as high as 1%. This will allow users to take a deeper control and independency in the moment of providing their liquidity. So if they are taking a bigger 
a bigger risk when creating like unstable tokens or tokens that are based on speculation, then in this case, they can set up the 1% fee and they will be obtaining a 1% fee on every swap that they do for the sake of them providing and risking their liquidity for it. In the case of less risk and more volume uh, token pairs, like for example, stablecoin pairs, they can provide ranges as low as 0 0.03, which will allow for like a better margins of profits because it has a lot of liquidity and they will be constantly using their liquidity and also having a lot of capital efficiency. As you can see on the article, I think I sent it to you, otherwise I can send it to the chat. Yeah, I shared the links. Okay, uh, I think there was, oh yes, it is on the medium. So basically what we focus on these releases is that we have a lot of capital efficiency. So users will be able to provide liquidity, get better returns, and overall expose less of their liquidity into risking for impermanent loss or for any price, a price for fluctuation. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Um, besides the concentrated liquidity, I am also happy to mention that we have been working a lot with the IBC bridge, the inter-blockchain communication bridge that has been a lot, um, implemented by the Antelope Coalition. I think that this is a very unique approach from the from these blockchains, from WAX, from EOS, from Telos and Proton to connect each other and allow a lot of things to happen. For example, on WAX, we, right now, we don't have a lot of, we have a problem with stable coins. We don't have, uh, the only stable coin pair that we had was USDT, but on Ethereum. And users, when wanting to use it, they weren't likely to use it because it costed a lot to bridge over to Ethereum and then change it on a sex. In this case, we have reached the USDT from EOS over to WAX, and we have seen a lot of incredible resor results with people starting to use the USDT from EOS. We are happy to provide more pairs. Our next goal is to provide an EOS WAX pair in, on WAX and also on EOS, so people can get and can hold their WAX tokens or EOS tokens on the blockchain that they desire to. And all of this is with the intention of empowering users, giving them more liberty to provide liquidity, this aim, um, select what they want to provide and how they want to get the returns done. That's great, Zuler. Thanks. Thanks a lot for uh, for sharing those updates. Uh, I, I do have actually a couple questions. Um, I remember when Alcor started a long time ago. I, I forget who the creator's name is. Um, Right. But yes, that's right. Um, is he still around in the project? Yes, he's still around in the project. What I will say is that I have been working with Alcor for almost six months. I have seen that um, Alcor, uh, Avril is an extremely working person. He loves to work, he loves to create new stuff. But as everyone has their abilities, he wasn't very kind to cameras or having chats around. When I met him, he was like, he offered me this position to be the community lead at Alcor, to work with partnerships, to be in charge of onboarding people, interacting and connecting with the community, and just giving my best for everyone to have the best user experience as possible. So uh, as every team, I am doing my part. Avril is doing an incredible incredible part with concentrated liquidity and the way everything is working right now and i am very excited for the future of falcor as we have a lot of plans ahead that's great yeah uh how many how large is the alcor team th these days the alcor team is around eight people at the moment but we're constantly expanding and hiring hiring more people as we want to import more users and provide more utility for everyone that's awesome. That's awesome. And uh, yeah, I'm particularly excited about having an EOS wax pair on EOS and having the same on wax. I know it's been annoying for me over the past years when I tried to convert from wax to EOS or back and forth. There was never really an easy way. There was certainly not an on-chain way. Uh, so it's really great to hear that Alcor may be bringing that finally to uh, to to our chains. That's amazing. Yes, I am also very excited for it. I think that this just takes gives place to a lot of things that people can develop. Maybe us can take a part in developing it, who knows, but 
For example, the most logical thing after having this IBC bridge is maybe setting up a multi-chain wallet, isn't it? Um, we also have a lot of ways to bridge, to interact, to make games play around and just have a lot of fun. That's great. And um, then, yeah, the other, the other oh, thing sorry, I wanted to ahead. highlight again, which is something you mentioned, the fact that Wax is using wrapped USDT from the EOS chain through IBC is really awesome, actually. And that's something that Zach Gall, uh, you know, speculated that might happen once IBC was deployed. Um, so it's great to see, you know, the, the market just taking charge and, and making that happen. That's very cool. That's amazing. And I don't have the official number, but I will say that so far we implemented these changes to the, I, I mean, we implemented the IBC bridge with USDT on Saturday and so far around 40K USDT has been bridged. This is like an approximate, but it is a lot considering the small amount of time that we have been around. Yeah, there you go. That's awesome. Um, Dave Rex, who is not a altcoin speculator at all, is asking for a friend if there's an Alcor coin. An Alcor coin. Well, I, I always like to say that we need strong foundations to have this kind of stuff, like an Alcor coin. So, in the sh uh, short answer, it is yes. We will have a coin. Uh, first, we, I do think that we need to establish strong fundamentals, like we are doing. We have implemented the Alcor swap B2 with concentrated liquidity. We have implementing this strong USDT first with stable coins. And we have still a couple of surprises for you guys before releasing a coin. But yes, we have planned an Alcor coin. There you go, Dave Rex. So you can tell your friend that he will yeah, be able to purchase a coin eventually. Happy, yes. <laughs> or may maybe uh, earn it, that's earn that's it for using the platform. Who knows, right? Um. Yeah, I, I mean, I, we already have some ways in which we want to distribute it. Um, I cannot talk much about it yet. So I think your friend will, will be disappointed in that way, Dave. But yes. <laughs> awesome. All right. Okay, Zulu, that's great. Um, yeah, please. Uh, 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 sorry. Yeah, will go for is it. asking is if Axa is still part of the team. Um, as far as I am concerned, he's not part of the team. We do have him with a special role on Telegram, which is VIP, because he has contributed a lot to the community. He's always active and he always provide, provides great ideas for Alcor. So he is very valuable for us. He has tons of ideas, tons of ways to implement and to integrate Alcor in some ecosystems. So we definitely want to keep him around. All right. Well, it was great having you on uh, the show, Zuller. Uh, please come back when the EOS Wax pair is listed and let us know because I'm will. sure I'm not, I'm not the only one that's really looking forward to that. I would love to do it. And we're very excited for that. I hope we can do it pretty soon. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for joining us, and we'll talk to you again uh, later. Thank you very much, guys. Have a great day. All right. Thank you, Zuler, for being our second guest on the show. Um, all right, moving on to some Pomelo topics. Let's see here. Pomelo Season 6 goes multi-pool. It's official. So at this time, I'd like to invite Andrew, our Pomelo product owner, to talk to us about some Pomelo updates. Thanks. How's the, uh, how's the audio levels? Probably better than mine. How are you doing, Andrew? I am doing great. Yeah, I'm uh, excited. I'll introduce myself. I'm Andrew. I am a product owner for Pomelo. Um, and I'm super excited to share um, for the next season of Pomelo, uh, we will be enabling both uh, multi-pools, which means, um, for a little bit of context, we've got uh, matching pools that any grants uh, that get support will be able to get a portion of. Um, now we've got multiple matching pools, so um, uh, we're still settling on the exact details, but the basic idea is um, we'll have sort of a general matching pool and then some more targeted matching pools, um, sort of uh, aligning with the, uh, the priorities of our matching partners. Um, and on that note, we actually uh, have a brand new matching partner for this season, and that is Talos. Uh, so... 
uh, many thanks to the Talos community for um, expressing interest, and um, I'm excited to see uh, sort of the the exciting public goods that we're able to uh, bring on board Talos. Uh, I know we've been supporting, um, in general, Antelope uh, coalition chains in the past, um, although I think that uh, a, a lot of that is determined by our matching partners. It's not our choice necessarily. Um, and uh, this time it looks like um, our EOS matching partners will be more focused on EOS, but it offers a great opportunity for uh, for Talos to get more targeted uh, projects as well. Um, so uh, for a little bit of background, I'm, I'm sure most people are familiar with Talos, but Talos was started um, around the same time as the original uh, EOS chain, maybe a little bit after, um, and it actually used the same uh, the same smart contract on Ethereum that EOS used in order to, determ to determine who gets what tokens. The only difference is they uh, capped it at, I can't remember the exact number of tokens, but there is a cap number of tokens. And then uh, since then, uh, it's uh, Talos has a little bit of a different, um, uh, a little bit of a different way of deciding uh, or of paying for transactions, let's say. Um, but it's it's all intercompatible with our inner blockchain communication, and this is going to be our first uh, uh, our first time using IBC uh, within Pomelo. So very excited to test that as well. Um, and yeah, more more details on the matching pools will be forthcoming. Looks like uh, our uh, potential date for applications opening is May thirty first. So just for a sense of timeline. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's other stuff that people want to talk to me about, but uh, yeah, open for questions. Very exciting season six, multi-pool and multi-chain. Uh, oh, that's pretty uh, awesome. I see uh, Mauro is 40,000 uh, Talos, actually uh, 140,000 Talos. So more significant than that. All right, and the season opening dates, I don't know if that's official or not yet, but I'm pretty sure that's the first time uh, we've shared those dates. So that's exciting. That's coming up in about three weeks. So get your, get your applications ready. Yeah, a little bit of unintentional alpha there. <laughs> there you go. All right, Andrew, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for, for joining us and giving us some updates uh, on Pomelo. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right, let me check here in the chat to see which of our guests is with us. We've got over 82 people right now. Pretty impressive, guys. All right, I do see that Adrian from Wombat is with us. Adrian, did you want to join us on stage at this time to talk about the Wombat X Accelerator? Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, sure. That's why I'm here. <laughs> awesome. Hi, Welcome to the fireside, Adrian. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks a lot for inviting me over. It's actually my first time as well, and it's impressive to see all the faces um, even if they are not real, <laughs> but a uh, great lineup of people here in the, in this chat. So happy to be here. Great lineup of, uh, in the audience and great lineup of speakers today. It's a fun show. All right. So what's this, uh, accelerator program all about? Yeah, it's, it's hard to call it an accelerator because, um, people have a very kind of narrow notion of accelerators in general, right? Yeah, people think that um, <clears throat> Y Combinator is like the mother of all accelerators and that uh, accelerators should always mean that you get like 7% of the equity and um, you help companies basically bootstrap whatever, fundraise, whatever, right? Um, that's not what Wombat X is. That's why we like, yeah, we sometimes don't really call call or like calling it an accelerator program, but what it really is is like we like to accelerate the growth of the community and the audience for 
up and coming Web3 games, right? So for us with Wombat, um, if you're not familiar with Wombat, um, Wombat is uh, a Web3 game distribution platform, as we call it. It's also, it also contains a wallet. So a lot of people are using this as a wallet for EOS, WAX, or also on EVMs. And, um, we're very, very strongly gaming focused. So you can basically download and play games and get NFTs. We've minted about 1.5 million NFTs on EOS alone, right? Uh, that we've, get, we've been giving away for people who play games through Wombat and uh, reach certain milestones in those games, right? And um, we're like, we do have both Web 2 and Web 3 games on the platform. Um, the Web 2 games, the traditional games, they're mainly kind of an onboarding funnel for us, right? So this is the way how we basically get millions, literally millions of people uh, from the traditional gaming space into Web3. Uh, so we offer them very familiar games, games that, not, that, that we haven't made, but that have been made by some of the biggest um, uh, publishers and game studios in the mobile gaming space or also on desktop. Um, some games have 200, 300, 400 million downloads. So these are like proven winners. These are games that are like truly fun to play, right? Um, we add this layer of NFTs and, and uh, crypto on top of that, uh, which allows us to get a lot of users, basically a lot of gamers actually started in web, within Web3. And then from there, um, they have an easier time actually playing all kinds of Web3 games, right? So we have um, all kinds of major games on the platform. Um, on EOS, unfortunately, we don't have that many games yet. I hope that there's going to be more, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we want to kind of work with um, all the major Web3 games as well so that our users can directly dive into kind of all the Web3 stuff that's out there, right? Um, and this, this kind of is where we start off with the accelerator program because we were basically, we're, we're getting a lot of inbound requests from games that haven't launched yet, who basically ask, okay, so um, how can we work together? How can we basically tap into your community? How can we get listed once we launch? Um, and these kinds of things, right? Um, so this was the main thought behind it, where we said, okay, it would be so cool if we had some kind of um, standardized um, yeah, schedule, itinerary, whatever, um, for these up and coming games um, so that we can offer them a program that will help them grow their audience even before they launch the game. Um, because that's a huge, that's a huge issue in, in Web3. I mean, that's also an issue in, in traditional games, but in Web3 games, it's like, how do I get exposure? How do I get seen? Um, how do I get um, people into my Discord? Um, how do I sell out my pre-launch NFT drops? Um, uh, how can I book these AMAs, oh, whatever, right? It's like a lot of questions. So we have, uh, our Discord community is um, about 100,000 people. Um, we have a fairly large Twitch channel. Uh, so we have about 150 up to 200 live viewers when we, when we go on a Twitch show, right? Um, we have a decent um, Twitter following and these kinds of things. So this is how we can help um, up and coming Web3 games to actually build your audience prior to launch. And um, that's, what we are, that's what we want to kind of streamline within the Accelerator program. And that's also why we were looking for a ton of partners who could help us um, either build the economy, build the community for these games, or basically provide other services so that we don't want to be taking care of all of that stuff, right? We, we don't view ourselves in the position to help these games with their technical stuff or with their fundraising or whatever. But what we can do is help them build an audience. But, um, we wanted to sign up partners and we're still signing up new partners um, pretty much every week. Um, and Enef is one of them. So thanks for that, uh, Zach and Eve. Um, but um, we want to have strong partners who will ba basically provide uh, services and offerings that we cannot or don't want to provide ourselves and um, thereby everyone basically wins, right? So it's kind of a win-win-win. Yeah, you do have a nice list of partners here on the website. Uh, I don't know if you want to maybe 
talk a bit about them and what they bring uh, to the table, to the program. So um, in general, um, our thought was that we want to make it very easy for partners on board because it's like, like we have a history of doing things basically bottom up, right? Uh, so we basically like launching things in a very simple way and then advance from there and adjust and like move ahead um, and, and be able to, to change things if they don't work, right? But that if you, if you want to launch with a lot of partners, we also don't want to make it hard on the partners to actually like, go ahead and sign up and um, and make or, or so we didn't want to make to to have them make big promises up front. Um, so there's uh, that's what we said basically. We said, okay, look, here's a template. Um, you can basically fill in whatever you want to provide, right? And the more value you want to provide, the better it's going to be for for anyone who participates, right? So. Um, one of the first partners we signed up was Kronos, uh, so the, the, the crypto.com blockchain um, spinoff, um, which was very nice. We, we had a contact with them, right? Because we thought, okay, let's let's try and get like the layer ones because they are very natural partners for us. They can expose themselves um, to uh, like game builders, and basically tell them about the advantages of um, launching on their network. Um, which for EVM compatible chains might be easy, right? For non EVM compatible chains might be more difficult, and it might might be a bigger commitment. But um, we thought, okay, let's just have I don't know a program for layer ones, right? And they can provide whatever they want. Um, so they could say, okay, um, you get a grant from us, right? If you if you are in the program and you commit to building on us or or whatever kind of rules, right? Um, you could um, you could get a grant, or this could be something like you get access to our accelerator program, so kind of a fast track to the accelerator program, right? Um, or like whatever it is. But so this was the original thought that we would talk to layer ones, like like Kronos was like a, like I said one of the first ones, and obviously ENF, um, and where uh, we have uh, Newcoin, which is also an, uh, an EOSL slash Antelope based. Uh, chain, um, and then we have um, a lot of uh, kind of non-blockchain partners or non-layer one partners, um, where um, yeah, they basically want to show kind of how they can help, for instance, with tooling, and all the while um, provide free credits for Wombat X participants, right? Um, so I mean, there, there's still a lot more in the in the making here, um, where we'll have even more value. Um, but um, that's stuff like uh, Beamable, um, Lifty, right? Um, we have Everson who who provide um, consulting. But like we're, I think we're in talks with like about twenty to twenty five more companies who want to be part of that and who want to provide value who we didn't have kind of in the initial announcement, but who will be signing up over the next weeks and months. All right, that's great. So, I mean, I've always recognized Wombat's ability to really build communities and, you know, 100,000 members in a Discord server is very impressive and, and a testament to that ability. And so, if I understand correctly, really this partnership, this program, is going to enable you to leverage that community to introduce it to new new games that they're interested in. At the same time, uh, introduce games to a large community that's already that you've already built in and that you've already gained their trust. Yeah, exactly. So um, it's essentially it's an eight week program, um, and so the, the 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 schedule is going to look different for each participant for each participating game. But um, there's, for instance, there's going to be an AMA week, right? So we're going to be doing AMAs with uh, the project throughout our channels, right? There's going to be one on Twitch. There's going to be one on Discord. There's gonna, there might be one on, on, on a Twitter space and so on, right? And there's going to be, um, uh, uh, I don't know, um, a, um, a, maybe an airdrop week if they have um, NFTs or... Um, or tokens that they want to airdrop, right? 
um, we have a way of qualifying uh, quite a lot of our users, right? We have close to 4 million signed up users within the Wombat ecosystem. Um, most of them have a wallet. Um, a large portion of those hold some kind of crypto assets in their wallets, right? So I think about 2 million people hold some kind of, of crypto um, in their wallets. Um, so, so we can totally run um, sort of like giveaways, right? There can be tournaments, um, there can be streams. So we, we have different kind of weeks that we shuffle around in the, in the schedule. Um, we're also uh, in discussion, for instance, with an esports channel, and they, um, they run a, a show um, that's not directly esports related, but that basically gives exposure for games to their audience, right? So we can have a week of this. And, and and so on. So so that will also slightly depend on kind of the final lineup of the partners once we actually start the program. Um, but we do have this concept of of these weeks, and um, yeah, that's that's supposed to really help build um, build the audience. So most of the projects that are applying have a let's say a Discord server size of between one and five thousand, right? And obviously the goal should be to get to whatever, like 10,000 or 15,000 that, that by the end of the program and these kinds of things, right? And obviously, eventually, once they actually launch their game, they will be listed in, the, in, in Wombat. They will get free um, engagement campaigns. So we have challenges, we have um, quests, we obviously have NFTs that we give away and stuff, right? Um, so they, they will be listed under a separate category of Wombat X games, um, like grad, uh, graduates or um, um, uh, alumni. And um, yeah, they, they will have their special place within, within the Wombat playground. That's great. And so how can people sign up for this program or, or sign up to the Open? Or what, what are the timelines around that? We basically just announced it last week, Thursday. So that's when signups um, or, or applications officially opened. Um, we already we already had a bunch um, even before we uh, publicly announced it. Um, there should be yeah. So if you go to um, I can I think I, it's better specified posted here right. Um, we have a we. We have a, a form on um, on the Wombat X website. So if you scroll down a little bit, um, you'll find a, a form. Um, there's a little button apply. You click that. You, you fill in the form. Um, there, it also states which requirements we have, right? So um, there, there, there should be something that's already kind of playable, um, even if it's not publicly available. But it should, there should be kind of a demo. Um, of the game, um, but uh, yeah, um, and then the, during the, the program, it uh, it would be required that uh, there's going to be a Wombat login, um, and um, yeah, maybe they will want to like integrate with one of the partner chains and so on, right? Um, and uh, we will want to get a little bit of the token supply in order for us to be able to kind of sp spread it or share it with our uh, community. Um, so uh, it's it's very it's very like low barrier um, uh, requirements to to actually join. But uh, obviously, you should be a game, right? Uh, this should be a Web three game in the making. Uh, like how much Web three it is um, doesn't matter that much. Um, but uh, there should be some like blockchain or Web3 component to it, and then um, we can have you in there. Um, I think we have about 20 applications so far, um, but there's still a little bit of time for uh, to apply for for this for this first class. Yeah, so I found the form. It says on here uh, May 18th is when uh, submissions close. So that sounds like uh, at the end of next week. For those who still want to apply, yes, go ahead. So if you're if you're building a game, um, Web three game specifically, then um, go ahead and press that button, fill in the form. Um, ideally, do spend a little bit of time in filling in the form. That really helps us 
in kind of pre-selecting and stuff, right? Um, and then, um, yeah, we're happy to, to have you. There will be a demo day, um, demo days, depending on how many applicants we are making through the first selection process. Um, and the partners will help us select the winners um, or the, the ones who actually make it into the program. Our goal is to have five games in the program, the first class. Um, so there will be a selective process. Um, there will be competition. Um, so make sure that, um, that there is something you, you can show. So, um, it, it, is, it is not like um, you, you don't just get in like that, right? There, there should be some barrier there. Sounds like a great opportunity for up and coming games. Daniel here from Pomelo. I'll just vouch for the impact of the Wombat community. Uh, if we, when you look back at the Google Analytics for Pomelo, we still have this outlying spike for the season that Wombat participated with a grant in Pomelo. And, and you guys put out some, I think you guys did some push notifications or something. And we saw a huge volume of users coming to Pomelo from that. Um, so if, if it's anything like that for the other games participating in this program, I'm sure they'll see a big spike in volume as well. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. Um, push notifications and the in-app notifications that we do are among the best ways of actually engaging people with, well, products listed or products that or whatever, whatever content um, we publish there, right? Because um, we do have an installed um, audience of a few hundreds of thousands of devices. Um, we also have a, a desktop app out. Um, we've had that for like two weeks. Um, it's, it not, it's not a fu full functionality, but this will also help um, spreading the word, right? Um, because we already have a few thousand installs there as well. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's yeah, as you said, um, <laughs> that's um, among the, the most efficient ways of spreading the word about uh, games and what other, whatever other applications as well. All right, we got a quick question here from the chat. Uh, Sapiens ask if he can import his current EOS account into Wombat or if you can only use the uh, Wombat provided keys in the Wombat wallet. And you can also import your existing EOS account. Um, you can do that upon onboarding. Um, yeah, you can also do that. Um, you will be able to choose whether you want to have it backed up using our backup system or whether you want to keep the backup with yourself. Um, so we wanted to make it very flexible for people. And in case, uh, in case some people don't don't know, or maybe it's changed, I'm not sure. Is Wombat still offering free EOS accounts when you uh, when you download the wallet with the option of, you know, buying that private key if ever you want full access for just a couple dollars? Exactly, that's still the case. We've always done that. We're we still want to keep doing this. Um, so when you download Wombat and you create your EOS account, this will be free. Um, however, because, I mean, we would like to give it to everyone for just fully free, right? But um, we all know that whatever is free in the blockchain space will be exploited, right? So we had, uh, we had to introduce this way of, okay, no, you cannot export your private keys um, unless you pay a little bit or yeah, make a little bit of a payment. Um, actually, that's officially, that's $2 if you do it through the store. There's also ways of doing that um, by paying a small amount of EOS. I believe it's like we've never changed it ever since we introduced that, I believe. So I think it's still at 0.5 EOS. So that, that's actually a hack to get it much, much cheaper than buying it via the store. Um, but yeah, uh, you can, th that's how it works exactly. Awesome. Yeah, that's been really good. Um, I've recommended Wombat Wallet to a lot of people who I wanted to introduce EOS to, and I was like, what's the easiest way to onboard them? Give them a, get, get Wombat, and then, and then they're in there right away, w whatever it is to play, uh, you know, play around with NFTs, play around with games, or whatever, it's always worked really well. And um, uh, maybe one last note, because um, uh, I think that um, I mean, we're, we're, we've always been very, very 
loyal um, and also very kind of bullish on EOS um, specifically as a technology for new blockchain users, right? It would have been fairly easy for us to move away from from EOS, um, like if had we wanted to get maximum exposure for um, to, or yeah, let's say for for blockchain blockchain focused people, right? So obviously there's much more money and there's been much more traction in all kinds of other networks like Ethereum, Polygon, whatever, right? Um, but for us really what matters more is this first time experience that people have with their NFTs and their crypto when they first come in and they're not used to blockchain and they're actually gamers. And um, that's why we're still minting um, these NFTs that we're giving away via Wombat and Wombplay. We're still minting them on EOS, right? Um, and we'll have a next, um, next big uh, um, collection there that we'll, be, that we'll start handing out. So um, I don't know the exact number, but yeah, I think I said it, but it's about 1.5 million NFTs that we've minted so far um, on EOS, uh, give or take. Um, won't lie, um, but like we, we'll keep minting a ton of NFTs on EOS because we think it's fun. Um, there's a few things that that we could use um, in terms of um, EOS um, EOS ecosystem in terms of NFTs, right? Um, but apart from that, um, it, we would love to see uh, more traction in terms of um, uh, projects building on, NF, uh, on on EOS with NFTs. Um, we also have uh, Dungeon Worlds, which is in the making, um, which is kind of an upgrade to Wombat Dungeon Master or kind of a meta metaverse, metaverse version of Dungeon Master. Um, and we would love to have this um, running on EOS if it's worth it, right? We totally, we're currently building this mostly on WAX, um, but there should, it should become multi-chain. Um, and we would we would love to have that on EOS if it's if it's really worth it. So the more the more traction we see on EOS and the more projects there are that that, that have a ton of uh, NFTs and are looking for more for more utility for those NFTs, right? Um, we would love to have them. A, we would love to have them on Dungeon Master right now, and then B, we would love to have them in in Dungeon Worlds um, later on. Um, and have a have a have strong reasons to actually uh, build and maintain an EOS based version of Dungeon Worlds as well. So would we'd love to to see that. That's very exciting. I was just about to ask you if Dungeon Master was still going. I got uh, I got hooked pretty hard on that when it when it came out. I don't I don't play it anymore these days. Uh, but glad to see Dungeon Master and the and that world is still alive and kicking. And you guys are actually expanding it. That's awesome. I think um, Dungeon Master, uh, in Dungeon Master we have, oh, I'm checking, um, we have about 740,000 NFTs staked in Dungeon Master on EOS alone. I think the number that we have staked on, uh, on Atomic Hub, uh, uh, sorry, on WAX is, uh, is pretty similar. Um, so uh, for us it's really, um, it would be really great to see like more infrastructure, more different marketplaces. Um, um, more, uh, more, more tools um, on EOS, right? So that um, there is a reason why so many NFTs have been minted on WAX. It's not just like uh, resource cost uh, was obviously a problem back in 2020, but that's not a problem nowadays anymore. Um, it's, it's all about the tooling and kind of having this ecosystem of, of things that actually run there, right? Um, so we would love to see that right now. Um, I believe that um, we're providing for about 90, or our NFTs are providing for about 97% or so of the total <laughs> traded volume in terms of EO, uh, NFTs on EOS, on, on the Atomic Cup on EOS. Um, we would love to see more kind of competition, more other um, collections. So if you are an NFT creator um, on EOS or thinking about doing that on EOS, do it. Just create your uh, collection. Do apply to be to get listed on, um, uh, or become stakeable on Dungeon Master. We would love to have more, um, more EOS collections there. Um, that's always great, right? We have um, 
100 NFTs per person stakeable on each of these blockchains. There will be more blockchains in the future, but um, we currently have WAX and EOS only, right? Um, so we'd love to see more diversity there. All right, so if you have NFT projects on EOS, make sure to reach out to Adrian and the team at Wombat. All right, Adrian, thanks a lot for coming on. Uh, hopefully, you come on the fireside again sometime in the future when you got some more great updates for us, maybe at the end of the, uh, the More Than an Accelerator program. Yeah, totally. I'm happy to do that again. And it was nice to talk to all of you here. Thanks. All right, thanks. Have a, have a good evening. I know it's, uh, it's already pretty late where you're out there, so thanks for joining. All right, moving on to our next topic of the day, EOS EVM webinar coming up, hosted by Zaisan in collaboration with the ENF. This should be very exciting for everyone looking to build on the EOS EVM or looking just to learn more. So let's see here. Do we have Adam B in the house? that's ready to join me on stage to talk about this webinar. We certainly do. Can you guys hear me okay? All right, Adam. Yeah, we hear you. Great. Thanks. Thanks for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Great to be here. Greetings from Dublin, Ireland. Well, just outside Dublin. Oh, yeah, so that's interesting. I should compile yeah, yeah. the list of where all our guests are from. This is probably, a, probably an interesting uh, variety there. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. Yeah, so we were obviously Adam here, uh, my brother Sharif, we were EOS Dublin, very involved in the ecosystem from the from the early days. Then we were one of the co-founders of Europe Chain, um, and Europe Chain has now morphed into to Zizan. So uh, yeah, for those of you that don't know who we are, what we do, essentially we very involved in the antelope ecosystem i guess we have a service division we help build products i guess you could call us kind of a a startup studio we help get projects off the ground um working very closely with the enf and delighted to be doing so like we're very passionate about eos and antelope and everything that's everything that comes with it so i think adrian said it really well i, I really want to see more projects building on here um so certainly what we tried to do this year was really ramp up our content uh, creation and and part of that was you know i guess we didn't really want to just flood with blogs and and ebooks we are doing that if anybody's interested but we also wanted to focus in on video as well so we launched a, a new video series called the ledge um essentially we'll do regular kind of video interviews uh, you know every range of different topics we did uh uh, a really good one last time on tokenization of real world assets and now i'm very excited to announce the next one which is essentially all about the evm so it's introducing the evm how to supercharge your your ethereum dapps um, i will be delighted to be joined by nathan also matthias as well um, so just, I will post the link in here, guys, but if anybody wants to, to make notes, we will have the, the live broadcast. Um, I will post the link one second here. Um, yeah, we've got Thursday, May 18th. And let me just post the link. Is the best place to post the link in the chat or should I put it in the general channel? What, what do you got? Yeah, you can put it in the chat. We'll, yeah. uh, we'll try to reshare it on uh, the other platforms that we're streaming to as well. Yes, awesome. So look, please register. Anybody who can't be with us live, we will send out recordings um, of that. But essentially, we, we don't, I guess, want to, we want to do a few things with it. We want to understand, of course, what the EOS EVM is. You know, I'm not a techie. I'm more of a business guy. I help to, to kind of build solutions, strategy. So I'm going to be coming from kind of that point of view. It's, you know, what are some of these potential benefits, real world use cases. Um, we want to talk a bit about the, you know, the development process, how we got here. Um, I think one thing I'm, I'm really excited about, I think Nathan's on here too, right? Um, but we are going to do a showcase and a workshop as well on that webinar. So it's not just going to be us, us talking. So we will have it broken down into kind of 
you know, introducing the EVM, how it works. We have a range of different questions. And again, if anybody would like to suggest some questions for me to ask, uh, please let me know. But I would love to, you know, see some of you there on, on the 18th of May. All right, that's great. Thanks, uh, thanks for joining us on the far side. Uh, I know Nathan is also part of this uh, webinar, although I'm not sure if he's aware yes. or not, based on his comment earlier in the day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, do you, anything you want to add there, Nathan? No, he really captured it all. All right, there you go. Um, yeah, uh, Adam, that was really great. Uh, nice clear explanation and yeah again we're gonna invite everyone to sign up uh, to the webinar when is the uh, when is the date and time again and 18th of May let me see here May. Time. let me see it should be on the on the, the end of next week that is the end of next week yes um, and that is at 4 p.m. Let me see. It's in my calendar here. Yeah, my time, it's, it's, it's 4 p.m. That's, you know, Irish time. <laughs> um, I don't know what that is for everybody else, but so what are we talking, like 12 Eastern and... Yeah, I'm not going to list out the time zones, but we, we've got it here on the sign up page. Anybody who'd like to, to join, please come along. As I said, if you can't be there with us live, we will be sending out the recording. Um, uh, and hopefully, yeah, really looking forward to, to speak to you, Nathan. And we've got Matthias as well on there. So, yeah, any questions you'd like me to ask? We're going to be running some polls during the session as well. Um, so, yeah, really excited and great to be here, guys. All right. Thank you for joining us, Adam. No problem. All right. Moving on to our next topic. Let's see. Is uh, Jillian Gotto available? I see her in the chat. I think it's her first time here. Uh, let's see if you can, uh, if we can hear you. You may have to play around with your audio settings. Oh, there we go. Hmm. Hi. Maybe. Can you hear me? Yes, we can oh, hear you. Yeah. All right. Yes, we may. I totally got my time zones wrong and I was wrecked. So I was going to lie down for a bit for my late night call. <laughs> so apologies. <laughs> yeah, all good. It's, uh, yeah. A lot, a lot of different time zones coming together for this show, and uh, this is not the first time that happens. No problem. All right. Quick introduction. Jillian Godfill is a CEO, a Web3 advocate, a journalist, a speaker, and a law changer. Uh, welcome to the fireside, uh, Jillian. Maybe we can start with a quick introduction, maybe a bit of, of your background, and then uh, talk about the nice coin telegraph article you wrote recently about the eos community grassroots comeback attempt oh great thank you so much i'm delighted to be here and apologies to be like 20 minutes late thanks um yeah no i am um, i've been in this space for a while i'm a fintech journalist originally so i've got like 30 plus years in fintech from both sides like with uh, i've been on pr i've been in journalism been in marketing um where i lived all around the world and and came back to ireland and um, so I sort of found out about uh, blockchain back in 2017, I think it was. And it just blew my brain because it also had a bit of activism before that. I had lost my home to the banks. And I became an, ac an accidental activist. I began campaigning against the banks and, and the terrible things they were doing to ordinary folk. And, you know, all this, all this sort of whole unfair thing that came after the, the financial crash. And I lost my home to the banks. And I changed this when I changed the law, actually, because the, my home was repossessed. But I, I was still, uh, I still had the loan. You, you don't actually you can't have like the keys here in Ireland, and um, so I was forced into bankruptcy because I, I still had the loan. I still had a, a load of about a million, whatever. And then um, I, um, but I realised at that stage that that there was so much wrong what was happening in the world, and there was so much shame being put on people who'd failed financially. So anyway, I became this mad, raving, lunatic activist woman, you know, give, uh, defending ordinary folk and against the banks, and. Um, 
so as part of all that, I discovered when I became bankrupt that uh, as a bankrupt in Ireland, you weren't allowed to uh, run for public service because we'd inherited arcane UK laws. So in a moment of madness, I decided to take on the Irish government and I brought them to court and the High Court and all the way to the Supreme Court. And I said my constitutional rights had been infringed because although I'd failed financially, which was very, uh, very, very painful and very horrible, um, I hadn't, wasn't a bad person. I hadn't been thieving and stealing and killing and murdering people. So I should still be allowed to run for public office. So they changed the law and I ran in the 2014 European parliamentary elections. And um, I didn't get elected, but I did get 11,500 votes, which is not bad because I had no money. I had to borrow a car. You know, we're talking like I was on the dole at this stage because everything had gone, you know, belly up in my world. And then anyway, that all, it was a very exciting time in my life because changing the law, running in Europe, getting 11,500 votes. And then life went very quiet. I went, oh, it's my life over, except it wasn't. And um, uh, they say 2014, 2017, when I discovered blockchain, I went, ah. This is how we change the world. This is how we make the world out of place. And all those things that all of you guys all know about how making a difference. And it was so important. Um, and because of my background in fintech, I ended up, um, I jumped in with my two feet. Oh, this is amazing. I was so excited. And I, I was invited to chair conferences all around the world. And I had a great experience of going to Asia and to America and uh, all over Europe. And uh, as I say, chairing conferences, learning more, meeting people. As a journalist in this space, I learned very quickly because actually jumping from fintech into blockchain is quite different. There are so many gaps in um, in in understanding. It, it, it kind of blew my brain. It took me a while to kind of comprehend the whole concept of money and privacy and and decentralization. All these terms that we're all very familiar with now, of course, they're just it's just such a mind blowing exercise. But uh, attending the conferences and also interviewing the, some of the big big noises in the space was super because I learned very, 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 very fast. So that's kind of my background. And then with the EOS background is I would have been working with EOS, originated the EOS podcast, the EOS Dublin back in, I think it was 2018. And I've worked with uh, Wax and I've worked with Alien Worlds and Upland. Um, so a lot of the EOS community I would have known at Europe Chain, now Zizen. So um, I've been in this space for a long, long while, shall we say. Anyway, that's my background. All right, very interesting background. The roads that lead people to blockchain are always so unique and interesting. I always love to hear these these origin stories, if you will. It's a bit mad, and, and I know that's one of the questions I ask every time I interview somebody. And I'm so lucky, so I'm privileged to be a journalist in this space because I've interviewed like a lot of the top names, Andreas Antonopoulos, John McAfee, uh, Don Tapscott, um, and you know, a lot more uh, recent ones too, William, William... Um, my brain's gone now, William from Wax, um, and people who've been in the space for a long while, and it, I, I just love the journeys in here. You know, I really think that's that's the people, why people get into the space, and sometimes it's activism, sometimes it's just it's uh, amazing, just they're going, I'm just fascinated by the technology. And what I do like, though, I mean, I, I lived through the dot, dot com bubble, and I love that because it was innovation and technical innovation and rethinking the world. That was really fascinating. But in this space, it's those two things as well. But it's also, and this is not hippy dippy, you guys know this, it's it's wanting to make a difference, wanting to make the world a better place. And that to me is the fundamental core of why I love this whole space. All right, and then what brought you to uh, to write this nice article about uh, whatever happened to EOS community shoots for unlikely comeback? Right. Well, that I have to explain also to this community is I had heard about what was happening, right? And uh, from quite a few different con uh, connections that I had, they were saying this is amazing, it's happening, this is all fantastic. And I mean, obviously, it was starting for the last little while, maybe over the last year or longer, or whatever. And uh, it wasn't until recently that I went, no, this is actually happening. This is working. It really is happening. And I pitched it to my editor in Cointelegraph. Um, and he said, yeah. He said, but, um, you know, don't, because he, he knew I was a fan of this community. I mean, when I first came into blockchain, it was EOS was the first uh, ecosystem that I knew. So it was like, you know, first love. So you, he knew I was very passionate about this space. And he said, but you have to also be a little bit critical. You know, you have to, uh, you know, apply your brain. I also made, made a few mistakes in the article. I apologize. I, just, I, I actually, here's the thing. I actually asked someone, whom I'm not going to daub them in, but I asked someone to check my article for accuracies and they didn't pick up the mistakes. So anyway, I apologize for the mistakes. I, I did do what I thought was due diligence. Um, but there are some mistakes. Apologies. 
But I had to also um, write, I mean, I wanted to write this article because I'm so excited because I am emotionally invested in this ecosystem. And uh, not financially, typically, <laughs> most of it, but I'm emotionally invested. And um, I, you know, I, I had to, I mean, I, I said to Eve, I said, you know, the people who say you're a bit like Marmite, you know, can I, you know, you know, can you make an omelet without breaking eggs? And it was kind of funny. And, and so I had to take into account as much as possible everything. The only thing I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't represent apart from in, in a reportage is the actions of Block One because I got new. I, I approached different people in that. In that, I approached Dan, I approached uh, Brandon, produced, I approached the main uh, uh, media, and no one would reply to me. So I, I couldn't put their side of things. And, and to be honest, you know, you can tell from where I write as well that even though I tried to be very, very independent, I'm a bit of a fan. So I was rooting for EOS and, and something there was so much hard work put into it and so many different organizations and so much, you know, so much genuine tech being built here. And, and that was a question that I asked everybody that I spoke to. And I had a great privilege of speaking with a lot of people, a lot of cast members, you know, and I was sort of saying, is it community? Is it tech or is it funding? And repeatedly, People came back at time and time again. Every day I interviewed, and there's about six or seven people I spoke with, I think, community. So that's kind of um, the thing that, that I went, ah, yeah, that is, and it, I mean, like, and the community is coming back. And it's very exciting. I hope to do a follow up um, in a couple of months' time, see what else is emerging. Yeah, that's great. I did. Um... I'm cu I'm curious if there, if there are other mistakes I didn't, I didn't catch. The one that stood out for me was. Uh, the title, the Wax and Upland Fly the Flag for EOS, instead of, I guess, EOSIO or Antelope, which is which is something that we've seen in countless, countless articles. But other than that, I thought it was actually a really well-written article. You have uh, quotes from a wide variety of community members in there, and it's clear that you really know what's going on, and so it was really good to see such an article on, on Cointelegraph. Well, you're very kind. It was very important to me not to write a, uh, a shilling article, and I really wanted to express as best I could. It's, it's quite complex because also I, I'd been away for a while. So lots of things going on that I, I wasn't aware of. And I was going, what's happening here? What's happening there? Um, but I also had the privilege of speaking with, uh, Eve gave me his time and Zach and um, Doug as well. And I was speaking with, who else? Daniel, Aaron, uh, Lucas, uh, Dirk. I can't remember the moment, a few other ones. So people gave me a lot of their time, which I really uh, appreciated. Because um, I couldn't have, have, have um, written it without all their help because there's so much to go over. I, yeah, I could have been researching this for like months before I got this far. So everybody who helped me in the interviews fast tracked me into an article. So that was really cool. I really enjoyed that. All right. Do you have uh, any plans to write some more articles about EOS or maybe oh, other yeah. projects you're working on that you'd want to talk a bit about? Oh, totally. Because, I mean, I say I've been wax for years. I actually did a collection on wax uh, back, I don't know, what year was it? Was it 2020 or something? And it, it sold out in three minutes. Woo! And it was just because I, I wrote a, a book and I had a series of interviews of all people, again, like uh, John McAfee and Andres Antonopoulos. All that sort of and then I did uh, Bad Mom portraits of all my characters, which is like a cross between... Yeah, well, it's just the really bad portraits, but you could, you could kind of tell who they were. You know, it's like, oh, I kind of recognize that person, but badly. Uh, anyway, with the actual images, I put them up on wax and um, they, I mean, it wasn't a huge collection, but still I was, it was towards the end. It was sort of when I was working on the wax, uh, on different projects on wax, um, there was, the collection was selling out very quickly. Uh, the, the William Shatner, all, all that type of exciting stuff. Maybe it's about a year after William's big one. Um, so it was towards the end, I think, of, of collections selling out for the kind of fun stuff. Um, but yes, I mean, I, I just think, I mean, Alien Worlds, like I've done a lot of work with them. I'm a big fan of Sorrow and the team there. They And what they're doing with DAOs, that is just fascinating. I mean, Sorrow is so ahead of her time. I mean, I met Sarah years ago when uh, she was working for Ghostbusters and they were doing um, uh, the, the uh, working with Liberland. I'm sure you're, are you, are you familiar with Liberland? I have heard of it, yes. Okay, so I would have, um, I actually met Sarah at the Floating Man Festival in Liberland in 2019, I think it was. Um, that was, those are the days when if you tried to step foot on Liberland, it's a little patch of seven square kilometers between uh, uh, Serbia and Croatia. 
And if you if you if you try to land on that, it, it was a piece of land left over from the breakup of Yugoslavia that no one claimed, but they couldn't assign the boundaries because there was still boundary disputes between Serbia and Croatia. And um, if you set foot there, you'd be arrested. So I know when we went in 2019, we went on the boats down the Danube, and uh, we could see Liberland. But the uh, Croatian police were following us all the way down into the boats. And then up on, on the beach, they're all there with their guns, the big machine guns. So you couldn't get, no one's going to wait. You wouldn't obviously want to get land. That was kind of fun. But anyway, I met all the team there because they were working with the uh, with Liberland at that stage. Although Liberland's now moved over to Polkadot. But they were looking at running a, a, a government on a on a blockchain, which is kind of a fascinating thing. And I am the editor of, a block, of the Liberland Press, and I'm still the Irish delegate there. So um, anyway, but there's so many, I mean, sorry, go back to Sarah again from uh, Alien Worlds. That's a fascinating project, and it's it's huge in terms of mass adoption. It's and it's huge. It's not just the play to earn and uh, that kind of grinding that goes on there, but it's the whole concept of the DAOs and how you've got competing DAOs. And you know, if you're more successful, so it's got politics. It's it's like um, House of Cards or you know what what are these these uh, or Game of Thrones if you like without the dragons and sex. But <laughs> it's all about politics and interesting politics. So there's there's some of the projects coming through, and yes. Uh, I'm very happy to talk to people in doing projects in EOS. Very, very happy because, as I say, it's my first love. And I love the fact that the tech is great, a lot of innovation, and just a lot of bloody mindedness in this ecosystem because otherwise you wouldn't still be here. You have some fascinating stories. That's awesome. You'll definitely need to come back and, and share more more fascinating stories uh, from your life. Uh, game. Um, Alien Worlds, definitely a very interesting project. The game of DAOs that is currently going on, very fascinating. Um, maybe maybe we'll be hearing more about Alien Worlds. I know they've been talking about utilizing IBC, going cross-chain, stuff like that. So, and, and they've been very successful. They have a large treasury. There's, they're, they're funding all sorts of projects right now every week through those planet DAOs. Uh, very interesting stuff going on there. No, it's cool. And also, I work with uh, Upland as well, and they're an amazing group. They are just, um, uh, the, I, the, the whole team is amazing. I, I interviewed Aidan years ago, I think it's for the EOS podcast, actually. Oh, no, it for Voice. I used to write for Voice uh, back in the day when, uh, before it became an NFT platform. I was working with the crypto writers team, and again, gave me a huge opportunity and to afford me to interview different people. And at the time, I was like going, Metaverse? Metaverse. what is this metaverse thing you know and obviously it's moved on a lot since then and um we um what they're doing is amazing they're creating communities and they're creating uh like metaverse as a service almost and where the push for them it's not so much the land sales although that's where it comes from obviously it's a property uh, monopoly based property game but it's the communities building on top of that but that's interesting where you've got real life communities working and having fun and creating games and enterprise and and it's it's not just the you know the axie infinity idea where it's just the grinding which is a bit, is a bit, a bit hard to take this is actually communities and doing interesting stuff then there's, there's, there's unicef i think is on there too as well they've got other charitable enterprises looking to raise money through the medium of the metaverse which is very exciting all right um any questions here in the chat jack bites saying that Jillian's got that Irish energy that propels us to follow her. Yes, awesome. You've uh, Yeah, it's been great having you on uh, on the far side. If you're interested in DAOs and what's going on with DAOs on EOS, then I would invite you to stay on the far side for just a little while longer. We're going to be talking with Haifa DAO very soon. We have a couple of other team members joining us today. Uh, so, yeah, so stay tuned for, for, for that. I'd love to stay on. I'll just turn off my mic now, shall I? And stop um, boring the airwaves. Not boring at all. Thanks a lot for, for joining us, Jillian. We and hope you, uh, hope you come back. Again, yep. and thank you for your patience for waiting. I just had totally, I'm up there lying down going, oh, I'll get up now in half an hour because I'm really tired. <laughs> and oh, I'm on now. So sorry about that. But uh, no, thank you so much for inviting me on. You're very good. No worries. We have we had a lot of topics to cover today, so we, we definitely had some more stuff to talk about. But it, it, the show actually started an hour and a half ago, not an, a half an hour ago. But anyways, that's all good. Thanks again for joining us, and hope to have you back on soon. And I'll be at the right time the next time. Oops. <laughs> all right. Okay, before going on to Haifa, 
Um, just want to bring up a couple of quick hitters for the community here before we move on to our final topic. And uh, so, DeFi Box officially opening EOS EVM RPC node just a few days ago. The, let me share here the article in the chat. At first, we had the ENF uh, providing the uh, the first EVM RPC node, but now it's great to see that other EOS community members are also getting in there and providing support for the EOS EVM. So there you go, some little updates from DeFi Box, and then. Uh, another topic I wanted to mention, BBS Network Interview. So BBS Network is kind of a like Reddit-style uh, uh, board that is built on EOS, that is gamified, incentivized. They've been running for a couple of years, actually. Uh, seems like the project is picking up uh, steam. And more uh, very recently, the ENF interviewed Eyal from the BBS network. Eyal worked with Bancor as well in the past, for those of you who uh, are familiar with that project. So I'm going to share the YouTube link in the chat here in just a bit. And I'm actually going to ask everyone in here to try out the BBS network and join the EOS English community. Why not? Get in there, see what the onboarding process is like, try out their mobile app, and, and we can give some feedback to Eyal, who's probably going to be joining us on the fireside next week to talk more about BBS. But I wanted to give you guys a quick teaser, get you hyped, get you curious, get you trying out the BBS network so we can have a nice conversation with Eyal about this app next week. And here's the link to the specific BBS uh, community that I'd encourage you guys to join. I think there's four people in this community yet, so shouldn't take too much to really drive those numbers up and uh, you know give a nice uh, give a nice fireside welcome for for Al for next week. Give him a little surprise. All right, wrapping up the show today, last but definitely not least, we kept these guys for last because I don't know how long this conversation is going to go. I don't know what we're going to end up talking about, but obviously DAOs is a very popular topic these days in the crypto space. In EOS specifically, Haifa has been working towards releasing their tools on the network. The beta sign-up uh, waitlist was announced not too long ago on the Fireside and in the community, so you can sign up for that if you haven't already. And uh, yeah, at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Brandon Lovejoy, and he's going to introduce uh, the Haifa team and some of the content that they've been working on. Thanks, Steph. What's up, everybody? This is Lovejoy. Um... Yeah, we have a few members of the Haifa DAO team with us today to give us an update on the latest developments. And just a little backstory. So just eight months ago, uh, September of last year, after working their way through the ENF direct grant framework, uh, Haifa DAO team was awarded with a historic $850,000 grant to bring their organization in a box DAO toolkit to EOS. And the direct grant framework as many of you know, is a milestone-based grant program, and Haifa is currently on the sixth of seven milestones. So they're closing in fast and have now opened up their beta program waitlist, which I'll drop a link to in the chat here in a bit. <clears throat> Today, they're taking a little time to join us and talk about that beta launch and give us an update on where things are at and talk about some exciting Haifa features and take a few questions. So yeah, with that, let's get it started. Um, Alex, uh, co-creator and growth strategist with Haifa. And if you just want to take it from here, you can pass the yeah, mic to sure. you. Thanks, Brendan. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, really happy to, to be here and uh, amazed uh, to see the attendance of uh, this call. That's amazing. Um, yeah, a little bit of uh, a story uh, regarding the Haifa DAO. We started in 2019. Uh, so four years ago, and uh, we organized ourselves uh, as a DAO. 
And because uh, we couldn't find a technology that was suited to our needs, then we actually built our own and we used it while building it, right? And that's the best, uh, you know, test because we went through a lot of iterations and we uh, managed to really improve the product uh, to the point that we are now ready to go to market with it. And uh, as Brendan was saying, we have announced uh, recently in April our uh, beta list uh, opening. And uh, that's uh, really the invitation that we want to make uh, to all of you today. Uh, if you want to experiment with a DAO and uh, uh, create a DAO for your project, for your organization, please reach out to us and we'll be happy really to embark you on the, um, on the beta program. We are anticipating that the beta uh, launch uh, will be around, you know, around in a couple of months, a little bit uh, more potentially, but uh, that's really the horizon uh, we are working towards. And uh, what we want to do is to bring all the energy of the, the EOS network on board with us. Um, we ju just opened the, the beta program and we got really huge interest, uh, you know, from uh, different groups in the EOS network. I'm um, thinking of, uh, you know, Eden, EOS Nation, Fractally, uh, you know, um, uh, the Korean uh, community. Uh, so really different uh, nature of projects that are willing to not only create the DAO, but help us create, uh, you know, energy inside the network. Uh, we have created what we call the IFA network, and uh, that's really this idea um, of a collaboration network, you know, where all of us can really work together to create value uh, for, for the EOS network. And um, uh, so through this process, what we want to do is to uh, transition a lot of, you know, organizations that are operating in a traditional economic system, we call them the Web2 organization, and transition them into the Web3 space using a DAO. And that's really where the opportunity is, because uh, that's a call to action, you know, for, for all of us here and beyond uh, to be actually supporting those organizations with uh, awesome technology services, you know, uh, and different uh, uh, for their different needs, you know, as they onboard uh, into this space. And our projections are that we think that we will attract 250,000 organizations by the end of 2026. And we can do that because of our um, strategy of decentralization, you know, exponential growth uh, by design, I would say, because we have in our design this idea of an ecosystem of DAOs. And we give the, you know, the, the power, of course, completely openly to ecosystem builders to create other DAOs in complete autonomy. And that's what allows us to project this, uh, you know, uh, tremendous energy coming into uh, the US network. So um, uh, that's really exciting for us. And we are really expecting, uh, you know, a huge influx of, um, uh, projects of uh, innovation ideas and uh, also businesses into the into the space and what is beautiful with that is of course as we are bringing members you know and uh, users of the DAO then there will be you know US accounts uh, created there will be uh, you know usage of the US token of course associated to that so really a, a, a huge opportunity for all of us to to collaborate together uh, but I stop there and I will pass uh, it on to Joachim to explain a little bit more the, the features that we are preparing for the beta. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, and thank you, Stefan and Brandon, for the invitation to the Swireside chat. I'm always glad to be in this community. Always so much activity going on here. Um, so I'm Joachim. I'm a co-founder here. I'm in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Um, joint joint uh, Haifa 2019. Since then, it's been an incredible journey, right? Four and a half, almost five years now, and we're getting ready for the beta launch. Um, so we were very excited, obviously, when we started uh, the big milestone project with uh, US and uh, getting new features on board with the Haifa DAO. Um, for us, we see the Haifa DAO almost like a third generation DAO, 
right? Just like the blockchains going through their own iterations for a second and third generation of blockchains, I think DAO is going through a similar iteration there. They're moving up the value chain. For me, this is really an opportunity to say, hey, there's this new kind of vessel, this new type of organization, right? And that doesn't happen, you know, that doesn't happen, you know, quite often. If you, if you look back, you know, uh, you know, organizations that were created in the 70s, let's say the LLC, I was just looking up LLC today, you know, was created in the 70s in Wyoming here in the US, and, uh, and the landscape hasn't changed much, right? Now we're seeing a shift where actually something new is coming on stage, you know, called the DAO, the Decentralized Autonomous Organization, and some incredible, you know, innovation and uh, interfaces are coming online um, that for us is, is, is a great experience. You know, it's, it's not that we see this as sort of a competitive space, it's really a cooperative space. It's a space where we're all coming together. Um, like when I hear Adrian talking about uh, Wombat, right? That's a great toolkit there uh, to bring tokenomics into sort of a gaming environment. And this whole shift from Web 2 to Web 3 uh, is really, to me, it's a paradigm shift. You know, it's a way to rethink our old applications, you know, built for traditional organizations, built for the legacy operating system, and bringing that into this new Web 2, Web 3 space, right? Where it's more about decentralization, it's about cooperation, right? It's how we're working together to solve these real hard problems. And uh, we believe the DAO is one of the tool sets, you know, the, one of the vehicles to do that. So let's talk about some of the features we're introducing. Um, you know, we started this, um, this uh, uh, sort of milestone project uh, a couple of months ago with uh, shifting into mobile, um, shifting into sort of the EOS platform. So uh, writing the smart contracts uh, based on EOS, uh, creating our graph database around that uh, and uh, GraphQL queries. Um, and then shifted into the actual features. Um, and that includes things like uh, smart badges. Um, what you typically see in DAOs are simple, you know, badge functions. We're introducing other functionality to say with these badges that you can award uh, to both sort of core team members that are part of a longer term, you know, team that are engaged inside the DAO, as well as community members that are outside the DAO um, and uh, giving them additional capabilities. Um, we worked on um, new kind of proposal types um, that includes uh, policy proposals or quests. You know, you can launch your own quest inside the Haifa DAO um, and define what the parameters are, you know, define what the payment is for the DAO um, and the quest, and then go on the quest and then the DAO can come back and say, yes, completed, here's your reward uh, by completing, you know, your stages there. Um, and there are, there are many more of these kind of proposal types inside the Haifa DAO. I'll give you one more, which is uh, the circle proposals. You know, the Haifa DAO is very much structured in a social, uh, based on sociocratic principles. Right, where um, you try to build a flatter organization, you know, there are no bosses around. You know, at Haifa, we don't have a CEO. Uh, we're all working inside the circles, and uh, we have councils, right, where we come together and say, let's make some strategic decisions inside councils and work with the other circles in a very decentralized way, right? So the core idea really is to push sort of the, the, the decisions towards the edges of the organization, right? It's not a centralized thing any longer, right? It's an internet native organization. You want to work with these teams all around the planet, right? And you don't care about, you know, boundaries anymore. It's an open space. Um, and you can still say, you know, who's coming into the space, right? You can still invite people to say, hey, become a team member. We have a role for you, right? Um, you can tell us what the commitment is for that role, right? And you can tell us exactly which circle you want to um, work in. So there is structure, right? That's important for us to have a structural part for DAOs, but also you have the community around that, you know, a supportive community that you can engage, right? That can be uh, participating in the decision process of the DAO. Okay, so moving on from the proposal types, uh, we also introduced a new democratic election process that's based on the Eden election process. Uh, probably many of you are familiar with that. That's a real-time election process um, where folks get together at a weekend and then figure out in real-time video chats who are the next uh, chief and head delegates, right? We brought some of this into the DAO and sort of mimic uh, the capacity to either import the chief and head delegates directly into the DAO and then go on and actually take action and create proposals and use their new voting power inside the DAO, right? Or you can replicate the entire Eden election process and create your own one, right? So, so you know, stepping back a bit, 
Um, Hi-Fi is, is, is a DAO platform, right? That means we can launch hundreds of DAOs. And uh, Alex mentioned we also have an ecosystem capacity where certain DAOs can launch other DAOs, right? Um, so it's a, it's a self-replicating network, really. Um, and uh, with the uh, democratic election process, you can say, give every DAO this, this capacity, right, to launch their own uh, democratic election process in their own community, right, in their own space, um, whatever they're building, right. It's a decentralized platform. We want to offer this capacity to really a lot of groups, a lot of entities, a lot of organizations out there. Um, to wrap this up, you know, a couple of other features that are coming. One important one is business templates. So launching a DAO is always a question of, oh my goodness, what do I have to do to get our organization up and running, right? Do you have to think about policies, think about membership, uh, think about roles for the organization? So we said, okay, let's shorten this process and say, we give you a template, set of templates. You know, If you want to create a startup, if you want to create a co-op, if you want to launch a movement with a DAO, right? Then you can do so just by selecting the template and then it includes, you know, um, as proposals, you know, includes um, policies, includes roles, includes badges, you know, includes circle structures that are typical for this kind of organization, right? And then from there, you can just refine it and say, okay, we're good to go. Let's um, let's launch it. Let's vote it in, and then the team is ready to uh, you know, go into into their venture. Um, other things we're introducing is the ecosystem building capacity that uh, Alex was mentioning. So the ability to, to launch other DAOs and to see how now the value and the, the funding can be transferred among the DAOs. You know, for us, the DAO to DAO space is really the big space that is opening up now in Web3. I mean, this is where you see something entirely new coming on the landscape that wasn't conceivable before. Now we can do that. Now we can launch hundreds of these uh, DAOs, independent, you know, autonomous DAOs out there. And of course, what they want to do is starting to connect, you know, starting to exchange value, starting to see who, who and how can we contribute to solve these bigger problems together, right? This is always our call for, um, you know, cooperation, coordination of these activities to, to move forward towards a common outcome and a common goal. Um, and then finally, you know, there's some other features around uh, payroll systems. Um, my background is in HR. So we created a simplified payroll system right in the DAO so you get rewarded with a composite salary that's based on tokens. But it's based on uh, voice tokens and cash tokens and, and native tokens, uh, EOS tokens, right? Um, and how you can, you know, say that certain, you know, roles inside the DAO can can be awarded uh, fairly, you know, and and can be configured also f again for each DAO uh, in a way that that works for you, works for your organization, right? <clears throat> And then lastly, we have multilingual capacity too. Um, we heard that loud and clear that uh, people wanted to sort of localize the interface, you know, talk to EOS in, in South Korea. They want to have, you know, their own interface so they can introduce this in their communities um, and not only, you know, native English speaking communities. Um, but things like that, I think, open up sort of the toolbox, um, the organization in the box, as we call it, right, to a lot, you know, bigger audiences and hope that we can uh, share that uh, knowledge that we gained, you know, to, to all these people out there. Thank you. Back to you. Yeah, and, and I wanted to, to add that we have some amazing projects, right, co coming on. Uh, we are uh, actually projecting um, that DAOs will be used in different uh, segments, you know, the socio-ecological segment, of course, uh, but also the socio-political segment. And Joachim can say a, a word on, on the uh, the different opportunities we, we have there. Uh, socio-economic segment, psychological segment, you know. Uh, so, so we are actually looking at mirroring the traditional economy, you know, and transitioning it into uh, the Web3 world. And that's that's really what uh, what we endeavor to do. Um, so uh, yeah, Joachim, do you want to say a word on the social political space? And then uh, we will pass it on to Gabriel to talk about uh, the products uh, and the product processes. Sure, sure, yeah, let me let me jump into that uh, a little bit. So, so 
the question here is, you know, what are the use cases for DAOs, right? What can people actually do with the DAOs? And it turns out that every group we're talking to has a has their own use case, you know, has their own way of seeing some potential inside the DAO that we haven't seen before. And we're kind of scrambling now to say, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Let's see how that works. So I'll give you a few examples here. Um, in the socio-political space, right? So DAOs for democratic elections, future of cities, municipalities, you know, political movement building, right? Um, we see some good traction there. Uh, one example is I was in Austin, Texas at the INC event. This is the independent national convention that's held yearly there. And uh, they're getting ready to sort of launch independence into the, uh, the US election process next year. And they're saying, let's get organized, but let's coordinate our movement. How do we do this? Well, let's see if a DAO can work, right? So now we're working with them to see how we can spread the movement, right? How we can again sort of replicate a single DAO into smaller, say, chapter DAOs in states and municipalities and smaller districts, right? And then they can get organized, coordinate what's going on, you know, figure out who the primaries are and so forth. So I think it's a great tool for building a movement. You know, in fact, if I think, you know, if Occupy Wall Street had a DAO at that time, they would have succeeded much, much more, way beyond what they intended to do. Um, so other things are, you know, um, uh, even more, you know, stronger political movements like Myanmar. Um, there's the national unity government um, that's forming outside of Myanmar, and they need to create a movement too. So we're talking about what's possible in a space like that. But it goes on and on. I mean, we're coming from a, a socio-ecological space, right? If you go back, way back four or five years, uh, we started with seeds. You know, seeds was the regenerative currency, the first iteration of that, and the regenerative movement that we created. Um, and we used the DAO to really launch that kind of currency and platform. Um, and then over the years, you know, the socio-ecological space became really important for us. Uh, I'll give you two examples. I was in Costa Rica earlier this year at Rancho Mago, beautiful rainforest, uh, biodynamic farm. Um, and they're thinking about sort of handing over the farm to the next generation of people, the next stakeholders, right? The next people who want to manage the farm, doing more, keeping keeping the original intention of why they came together there and uh, make it educational, you know, make it fun, make it uh, preserving, preserving the environment there. So, so a context like that, you know, is, is very attractive to see how a DAO can work. Um, another one is called TICA, you know, they're in climate action. TICA stands for Triggering Exponential Climate Action. Um, they're working on um, projects in, in uh, East Africa on the blue ocean economy. They're seeing how they can launch ventures, you know, that create sustainable, you know, entities that support uh, climate activities in these areas. Um, but then, yeah, also, also one more, maybe um, Alien Worlds came up here, right? The socio-cultural space is an important one for us. You know, it's these subgroups, it's, uh, it's these uh, subcultural areas, right? Uh, solar punk, you know, gaming guilds, you know, that, that sort of start to look at social change and social norms in, in new ways, right? And for me, that's a fascinating space to see how can a DAO play a role in here, right? To say, not only are we having fun with uh, the games and, uh, and creating these new spaces, but it can get serious, you know, it can get as serious as, whoa, this is actually my livelihood that's at stake here. I put part of my life into the DAO now. I get rewarded in tokens that are worth money, right, that are worth something in a circular, you know, economy context, or if I really wanted to, you know, jump out, I can, you know, come back and say, give me some fiat tokens to, to reimburse me for all my bills I have to pay, right? So, so there's this fluid um, boundary now um, between people moving into these DAOs and then moving out of the DAOs and still facing, of course, the reality of what we're all living in today. Um, I'll stop here. You know, there are so many more, you know, clients we're working with. Again, these are, these are doors that are opening here. Uh, we want to see more of uh, what's possible within the DAO context here. Um, so I think, Alex, uh, you want to move it over to Gabriel now for some more? Gabriel, are you there? Yes, I am. Am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you, Gabriel. Uh, I'm in the car, so forgive the audio if it's not fantastic. Um, I mean, just if, if I, I've been with Hive for just for the past few months, and it, it's every day I'm in uh, the meetings and working with the team on Discord, and it's just astonishing to see the depth of thought and consideration and the passion that's going into this platform. I'll just share a few of my own 
thoughts from my own perspective. You know, the world of work is changing. Um, DAOs we saw as automation, uh, and Haifa has seen it as a do, a, de- a decentralized human organization. And I think that distinction is magical. I remember times in my life having a sense of, you know, productive bliss, really b- blissful in the work that I'm doing. And it's only through the perspective of a decentralized organization and style of collaborating that I can see that happening for the majority of people and, and for an extended, you know, the fullness of our career can feel like productive bliss. And I think that is what Haifa is moving towards. Very exciting. Um, the way that uh, we govern um, uh, affects how we, uh, how we govern society, how we govern cities and countries. And this is all applicable through the, the, uh, the platform, the technology that Haifa is creating. And also, of course, in our own workplaces, um, how humans organize together to achieve better things faster at lower cost, at lower pain, lower headache, lower uh, failure rate. Uh, all of these things through the collective intelligence that comes through work in a decentralized human organization. Um, there's a big subject that's happening uh, known as third party management. What we can see is that organizations that used to be very large, like Honeywell as a conglomerate, they talk about unbundling of large conglomerates as companies become more efficient by being smaller because we have access to technology. And that trend is going to continue. And so the smaller uh, opportunities that are available through the efficiency of decentralized human organizations is exactly the trend that the globe is moving in. So there's four considerations that I think we're looking at uh, as a general uh, approach to uh, decentralizing uh, what we need to account for in an organization that I believe is being baked into the cake of the Haifa platform. And so those four things are to prioritize. We need to get really crystal clear on what our priorities are individually, but as an organization, as a team, as a function, as a department. And then we need to be able to assign. Uh, And these words are, are, are so obvious, but so difficult to achieve if you have experience working with other people in other organizations. So we need to assign um, people or responsibilities, accountabilities, and then we need ways and freedom to actually contribute. We have to coordinate ourselves, our workflow to, to, to create those projects and assignments and have impact. And then the fourth one here is compensate, right? We all want good, fair compensation. We want access to opportunity. And these are the things that decentralized autonomous organizations promise to solve for. We haven't seen that yet in the collapse of, uh, of protocol DAOs in 2021 and two, but through this approach of, of human, humanizing the organization with Haifa, this is, I believe, what we're, we're moving to achieve. So specifically what I'm doing, I'm looking to, I, I'm introducing aspects of agile methodology, um, parts of Scrum framework, uh, working with the different stakeholders in Haifa, including the clients themselves, the marketing department, the engineers, the, the DAO philosophers that we've got, such as you've heard from here, from Yahim. Um, and how do we blend all of those interests and, and, and ideas together uh, into a prioritized backlog, moving away from the risk of being a feature factory where a lot of startups, whether it's in Web 2 space or Web 3 space, get stuck is that founders can be so in love with their own ideas that they build what they think the market wants instead of validating what the market is willing to pay for and wants to use and how they want to use it. So we're, we're learning and the, the design function is fantastic. You're going to see uh, what you see now is already impressive in the platform, but there are new designs happening for the, for the dashboard, the onboarding process, the launch process, how to, how to set up the f- different facilities of, of a DAO. Um, and so it's becoming more and more user friendly. Um, so we're looking at qualitative research, UX interviews, user feedback, and then also including quantitative, um, which is the depth of product analytics. We can see the user flows as we start to scale with numbers. 
we can see where the friction points are in the platform and optimize in, in, in that way. So, um, so to understand the scope, just a little hint, um, workflow management tools are items like monday.com, Asana, Notion, ClickUp, uh, Jira, this kind of thing. And they have raised hundreds of millions of dollars through traditional venture capital, their Web2 based platforms, and they do not achieve anything like the direction that Haifa is moving in for, for those four vectors that I mentioned. Again, prioritizing work, assigning, contributing, and compensating. Uh, so I think the, the future of Haifa is very, very bright indeed. I think we're dealing with the most important utility for a public blockchain ecosystem, which is multi stakeholder synergy through Web3 incentives. Uh, with that, I'll pass back to you, Alex. Thanks so much, uh, Gabriel. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of questions on the on the chat, which is great. And uh, uh, if that's okay with everyone, I suggest we uh, start answering them. Um, I see the first one is IFA going to be open source at any time? IFA is open source. Uh, IFA has always been open source. And uh, we are welcoming, you know, developers willing to build, integrate with us, uh, you know, and, and create uh, uh, excellent experiences for, uh, you know, uh, companies, organizations, and projects who want to use the use the DAO. So definitely reach out to us. Uh, completely uh, welcoming this uh, uh, this kind of initiatives. Um, what would be a use case of a startup or a company shifting from web two and web three uh, to web three uh, through a DAO? So uh, there's a lot to say there. Uh, I can start, and uh, Joachim and Gabriel, if you want to, to complement that. But that's a really important point. As I was saying, our strategy is really to bring in you know the web two uh, organizations into the space. And uh, the um, real uh, difference, you know, the, the, the value added of uh, being a DAO um, as opposed to a traditional company is uh, first uh, to benefit from this uh, tremendous acceleration and visibility that you can get, you know, uh, in a DAO and within the IFA network, uh, partnering with the DOS network. Um, that's uh, a game changer, actually. You know, instead of being uh, isolated, you know, as a startup creator into your traditional organization and trying yourself uh, to develop the entire activities, to expand, to scale up, and to uh, actually support the entire weight of this expansion, you can enter now into a space that is driven by decentralization where you see people, talents coming in, you know, spontaneously to fill in roles uh, that they want to, uh, that they want to perform out of passion, you know, and uh, Gabriel was talking about the DHO, you know, the decentralized human organization. We've been living uh, and breathing, you know, this, uh, this uh, philosophy and this context. So what we've been seeing, uh, you know, in IFA, we, we have, had more than 300 members, you know, contributing to the project. And that was fascinating to see the level of talents, you know, that we attracted actually spontaneously without any uh, HR, you know, posting, job postings or things like that. So uh, ac by activating your, your DAO, you will see a lot of energy coming your way out of passion, you know, and showing up as they are because they will be the ones promoting their roles, uh, you know, to uh, to the to the down. Um, yeah, yeah, Joachim, you want to come? In? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank I, you. I've heard that, that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. not, not, not much to add here. You know, one, one thing I wanted to mention, last year um, we were part of the uh, BMW Foundation uh, Accelerator Program, and uh, they work with startups, right? Um, they choose, you know, every year uh, a cohort of startups, and that's where you can learn hands-on what the, what the real pain points are of startups, you know? That's where you see, you know, the founders have so many headaches and worries to go through to launch their venture, right? What a DAO can do is to say, well, let's take care of some of the headaches, right? Let's show you, say, you know, there's a question about templates here, right? What if we give you a you know, set of uh, templates for how you pay people, right? Uh, give you a set of 
templates that uh, declare, you know, five levels, you know, and uh, they uh, earn you these much tokens. And uh, here's the complexity, you know, assigned to each of these levels. Um, and here you go. So you get you get the boring stuff out of the way, right? I mean, who are, as a startup founder, founder wants to talk about market rates or, or what Alex mentioned, you know, the whole hiring process is such a pain, you know, to find the right candidate. What the DAO can do is to say, hey, we offer you a quest. Come on in, uh, do a thing for a month, um, and we'll see how it goes, right? And then you also get to know the people, you get to know the culture of the DAO, right? And you can establish that level of trust for me that's really at the heart of the DHO, right? Um, without trust, you know, you don't go far, right? You have to, uh, you know, come together and see that you can start to rely on the other people. There's certain accountabilities, yes, but we're doing this together, right? Um, and that's such a sort of strong space that creates alignment, creates coherent inside the core team, but it can also be extended outside, you know. So if a startup is going to grow and suddenly attracts a wider community, well, they can be there, right? You can actually um, help them to, you know, be in, in, in a way engaged in, in your project, in the product, in the service you're creating for your DAO. So all of this, you know, stuff can be embedded right into the DAO. So the the founders team can really focus on the critical items, right? The technology they want to launch, right? Um, the product they need to get to the market, right? Um, and all of the other, you know, organizational things can be, uh, can be, you know, embedded inside the DAO, embedded also in a structure that doesn't mean you have a startup founder that runs the entire show, right? There's no boss that tells everybody what to do. That is uh, a, a very, you know, tension-driven process that you can completely remove by saying, well, we have an organization structure based on circles, based on holocratic structures that are much more egalitarian, right? Much more inviting to others who can then come in, see how it works for them. And if not, they move on, right? They can move on into a different circles and even different DAOs if they wanted to in the network. And and even two DAOs, you know, my, I have a role in two DAOs now where I have uh, my um, task and my rewards defined, you know, in the Haifa DAO. <clears throat> But as well, you know, uh, give it another commitment, you know, of five or ten percent into another DAO that's dealing with a, a different, you know, space that I would like to get engaged in, and everybody's okay, right? This isn't like moonlighting or something else. You can do something like this inside the the DAO here. That's it for my end. Uh, I don't know, Gabriel, anything else on that? No, not for me. That was good. Yeah, so uh, there's also this, uh, yeah, this context of community uh, building, right? Because we have a really specific design, uh, which is action driven, but also including the community inside the space for uh, collective intelligence, for feedback loops, you know, and continuous improvements. So, you know, when you are a traditional startup, it's always uh, difficult uh, to create this community, right? You, you need to create it from scratch. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, effort uh, going into that. Potentially, costs also of promoting, you know, this uh, uh, the organization and attracting the community. Uh, in the DAO context, it's different because all the stakeholders, you know, whether they are customers, suppliers, you know, partners, investors can be included as members into the same space, you know, contributing to the success of the organization and getting rewarded for, for this contribution in the form, in the form of tokens. Um, so that's, that's really a game changer, I think, for, uh, for, for startups. So of course, it's, it's a lot of education, tra uh, transition process, but we are really, you know, at Haifa, we are not only focusing on the, technology itself, but also on the processes to uh, to make this transition easy. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, one, one proof of that is the, uh, the UI, you know, and the UX of the product that is really mainstream, really easy to use. Uh, we have also developed an IFA wallet, which allows uh, to onboard anyone without prior knowledge of the blockchain in two or three steps. Um, so they can create their US accounts, uh, they are onboarded on the IFA network, and they can click on a button to join a DAO. It's as simple as that to uh, get onboarded um, and to start contributing and start getting value out of this contribution. Um, and what that makes 
is that uh, you know the community members are now engaged, right? Because they are actually getting uh, rewarded for for their uh, for their contribution and uh, also acknowledged, you know, in in different roles that they can uh, play in the community layer. Uh, Joachim was uh, talking about the uh, the vote election process. There, there's also badges and community proposals that they can vote on. So there's a series of uh, features and functionalities uh, that are there to empower uh, the, the community surrounding the core team that is action driven. Uh, so we are combining, you know, all these parameters to create really efficient organizations and ultra connected interconnected uh, organizations throughout the network um yeah so that's uh, that would be the the response to to this question um i'm going through them i think um is there anything that i've not covered do you have any other questions we'll be happy to to respond <coughs> to anything um, I'll, I'll jump into the question real quick. Yeah, sure. Love Joy again. Um, I'm curious what, um, from a, like a UI UX perspective, um, is being done with, uh, with Haifa to abstract away like the blockchain, you know, EOS experience. Like, what can people expect when they come in? Like, how's sign on work and all that and stuff mm -hmm. that we have to deal with? Um, yeah, uh, in the Web three world. Yeah, so so we we sp spent a lot of time and effort uh, and energy on on making uh, the, the the user interface and the UX uh, really accessible to non blockchain uh, people, so that uh, the the DAO technology can become mainstream, uh, which is the, you know at the core of our our uh, strategy, and uh, we have. Uh, developed and, and it will be released for the beta version and I find wallet. So, you know, the process of onboarding is just uh, receiving an invite, clicking on the link, downloading an app and scanning, uh, uh, you know, creating the account and scanning the QR code to login, right? So that's uh, as simple as two, three steps. And then every time there's a transaction, uh, you know, that needs to be signed on the user interface, uh, the user will scan a QR code, right? Using this, uh, this application, their, their uh, smartphone. That's the only exposure they have, you know, with the, with the blockchain. Um, and uh, we, we made it, uh, you know, uh, uh, as simple as possible. And I, I think really we reached the point where it can be a, a game changer, right? We will test, of course, and improve along the way. And that's uh, why we are still in beta. You know, we will be still in beta. Uh, but the idea is really to continue improving on an ongoing basis so that uh, a large number of people, you know, we are expecting actual millions of uh, uh, members joining the, uh, the network. I was talking about 250,000 DAOs. Uh, so that's a lot of, uh, lot of members. And um, yeah, we, we want really to uh, to create the conditions of mass adoption. Yeah. Awesome, yeah. thanks. <clears throat> well, from my end, um, you know, it's one one side obviously is about the UX uh, and UI, the 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 visualization and how you understand the interface. The other uh, part that's more important to us now is how people can cope with these new environments, right? They're suddenly, you know, being thrown into an organization that doesn't have a boss, you know, they're thrown into an environment where they're asked to vote on proposals, right? Where they need to come to some kind of an agreement, right? Um, and it's not only, you know, single person telling others what to do, it's everybody coming together and saying, these proposals make a lot of sense, these one make less sense. What is the best way to actually vote for us? You know, is it like a majority vote? Is it a 80-20, what we're doing at Haifa? Is it a consent or consensus-based voting mechanism? You need to figure this out. And that requires sort of a real deeper engagement with who are we, you know, and what's the purpose and how are we solving uh, these these new work conditions that we are finding ourselves in. Um, we created a actually a workshop for that. Um, we call it the DAO activation process. So that's uh, a 12-step process where everybody, uh, we're doing that, launching that in cohorts. You know, I think there's one coming up very soon. 
um, where we help people to understand what these building blocks are of the DAO, right? Um, what does it mean to create compensation based on tokens? What does it mean to vote, you know, based on governance tokens? Um, how do you structure these circle thingies, right? Uh, and and who, who who can I, you know, uh, how can I, you know, nest the, the structure based on the membership uh, that's there? So these are lots of questions that are coming up that people who are entering these new spaces. And that requires some kind of a scaffolding, right, um, that we're providing for the DAO activation process. Back to you. <clears throat> Any other questions? While we wait for a question to roll in, <clears throat> just jump in if you have one. I'm going to just say real quick, I don't know if it was mentioned already. I might have missed it, but... We have a Twitter Spaces um, coming up with Haifa. Yeah. It's going to be on the 16th. Um, I'll get the time. Forget the time right offhand. Let's see. What is the time? Dun, dun, dun. Now I got to do my own music. My own hold music. It's, uh, 1 p.m. Tuesday, no, May 16th, yeah. Twitter Spaces there with Haifa. Thank you. So we'll be promoting that. Come on out, join the conversation. It'd be great to have everybody. Yeah, we're really excited to, to participate to, to that. And uh, yeah, really excited. All right. Well, thanks, uh, thanks to the Haifa guys for joining us, giving us a sneak peek at what we can expect more of uh, next week. And we'll have other other team members of Haifa joining us on that on that Twitter Spaces, as well as um, members from other teams. Also, should be good. So put that in your calendar. Tuesday, May sixteenth, one p.m. Eastern. <clears throat> Thanks, guys. All right, and I want to thank all of the great guests for today. All eleven of you, pretty awesome. That's a new record for the Fireside for sure. Um, I see here in the chat, we've got someone that's asking when open mic. Let's do it right now. Uh, Diadem, if you had a question, feel free to jump on. If anyone else has some updates they want to share updates or comments or whatever, share, comments or whatever, now's the time to do it. Hello, um, my mic uh, is on. Uh, you hear me well? Hello? Uh, we can hear you. Uh, we can hear you. Yeah, excellent. So, it was... Uh, very nice to uh, hear all these announcements and uh, about uh, Hyper Dawa and uh, EOS EVM and uh, games. So uh, I launched this EOS Heroes game uh, last week, and I want uh, to use this opportunity to invite everyone to come and create a character. EOS Heroes. There are already 12 people uh, from this community who created characters, and uh, it will be epic game on EOS EVM that we launched. So, uh, again, what is uh, EOS Heroes? You can think of it as uh, uh, any uh, multiplayer game like World of Warcraft, but uh, instead of uh, groups, you have uh, DAOs inside of this game. And you have uh, the world that is expanding through AI. And those DAOs, they're guiding the AI to expand the world. So everyone welcome to uh, create and play the EOS Heroes. Hey, that sounds interesting. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Uh, can you share the link to the game? There we go, eosheroes.space. Good stuff. Love hearing about new games launching on uh, EOSEVM. That's great. I have a question for our mic. Hello? Yes, who's this? 
Yes, this is Bjorn from the Lost Diamond Project. And ah, I yes, Bjorn. Co- yeah, thank you. W- welcome back I to the Fireside. It's been a while since we've heard from you. Yeah, I have been here every time, so I'm just uh, a little quiet in Norway and a little shy, so yeah. <laughs> but I have a question for uh, Nathan James. Because he... Hello there. Oh, <laughs> you tweeted uh, some beta uh, for the web IDE, and that's that right. is the best. Yeah, that's the, one of the best. I totally forgot I to have. talk about this, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, but this is the best thing I have seen for a very long time because I have kept my old PC from 2019 uh, because it's Ubuntu thing and it's very complicated. So when I saw this, I, I'm sure you don't remember, but I. Uh, we tweeted a little bit last summer, and you asked, uh, what is your favorite IDE? And I answered, oh, Remix is fantastic, so you should build something like this, and maybe you are still, maybe you are doing it. And you answered with this uh, smiley, blink, blink eye, and I, I thought something is going on. So when I saw this, I was very surprised. This is amazing. So can you please tell me a little bit more about it when you think it's finished? This is something that is backed up by the ENF, or... What is it? Uh, yes, so it is. Uh, first off, thank you for putting that seed into the back of my head because apparently that's what got us to where we are today. Okay. Um, this is definitely back by the ENF. Uh, it's in beta right now. We really just want to work out the kinks, make sure that uh, it's doing what it's supposed to. Uh, the intention here is that the developer's life cycle is a spectrum. At the very beginning, you're just learning, uh, so you need something to dive into really quickly. No setup costs, no no investment, time investment. You just want to you know, instantly land somewhere and start working, start learning. Uh, so that's, that's what this uh, tool is aimed at. And then at the other side of the spectrum, you have your true production grade uh, development environment, which is your local environment um, for us. For instance, now in the past, it's been setting up Cleos, Nodios, uh, CDT, the whole the whole EOS stack. We're moving towards something called Dune, which is uh, more just you cl- double click an installer and you're ready to go. You have everything installed for you. Uh, that's what we're moving towards. But we are missing that piece, uh, which used to be f- attempted to be filled by a couple different things. So there was the original EOS Web IDE made by Todd Fleming. Um, but it required that you log in to Gitpod and you fork it over to your repository. It wasn't as easy as Remix. Uh, there was also uh, EOS, well, EOS Studio, uh, which was also kind of the same thing. You had to sign up for an account. You had to do a bunch of other stuff. Um, and it didn't really feel like Remix, though. It did have some things which would be nice to have inside of this Web IDE. Uh, but this one is really made to mimic the experience of Remix. It's made to be as simple as possible. You can instantly deploy to the Jungle Testnet and interact with your smart contracts. Uh, it saves your your files to the to the cloud. Basically, you can uh, work with other people on it. You can throw something up as if it's a gist and give it to a friend. Say, hey, I'm having a bug with this. What what's the problem? Um, it uses a backend to build everything, so you don't have to install any local development environments. Uh, and we're going to start using it in some of our in most of our courses uh, so that we can really start onboarding developers into the EOS community for C++ development. Fantastic. So when do you think I will be able to build and deploy something? You can do it right now. The only thing you can't do at the moment is you can't uh, deploy to the mainnet because we haven't set up any anchor integrations or wallet integrations. OK. So you think that will take uh, a long time? or? Do you have a time? No, time not, for not particularly. Um, it's I don't have a time frame for you. It is top of the list of things to do, uh, and it shouldn't be that complicated of a task. It just it changes the paradigm of what what's currently happening. So what currently happens is all of the interact all of the blockchain interaction happens from the back end. Uh, so you know there's nothing on the front end which actually interacts with the blockchain at all. Uh, whereas in order to implement this, we actually have to implement a lot of the blockchain interactions on the front end so that you can start doing this with a wallet. OK. Fantastic. Great great work. Yes. Amazing. Thank you. And if you would like to implement that stuff, it is open source, and you can fork it over, and we would very much enjoy uh, OK. Some PRs OK. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thank you.
All right, looks like we're going to wrap it up here. Just another two and a half hours fireside chat. Still 65 people on Discord, plenty more on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, everywhere we're streaming. Very, very cool. Anyone have uh, any last words before we sign off? I just want to say, Nathan James, this is pretty cool. This even to a non-developer, this is a very this web IDE uh, thing you've deployed is very friendly. It's nice. It makes me very happy to hear. Yeah, I want to press buttons and write code and shit. It's fun. And you can <laughs> <laughs> do it. <laughs> All right, so while Brandon Lovejoy <laughs> goes around and presses button, writes some codes, we're going to sign off for today. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Join us again next week. We'll have more great guests, maybe not 11 of them, but definitely some high-quality guests coming up uh, next week. And so that's it for me. Until next time, have a good night, have a good week, have a good weekend. Hope it's sunny out there. Pool. Pool season's about to start out here. I'm going to go jump in the pool at my buddy's place here right after this sign-off. So until next week, let's go Yos! Go Yos! Go Yos!